from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in our Palo Alto studios today for a CUBE conversation. You know, every place we go, a lot of the, the conversation is about the future of work. And oftentimes that's really in the context of the tools, whether it's Slack or Asana or, you know, uh, Facebook groups. Everybody's trying to get into this. But there's a lot more to the future of work and really about talent and getting talent, a hyper-competitive talent space is about culture and ethics and morals and especially some of the stuff that we've seen recently with with what happened at Wells Fargo and obviously what's going on at Facebook, there's a much more complicated part of the story in terms of the people side. And we're excited to have somebody who's applying kind of AI and all the technology that we talk about all the time at the shows to culture. Uh, and so for the first time, I'd like to uh, welcome Mitch uh, Gidgen. He is the co-founder and CEO of Talent Fit AI. Mitch, great to see you. Hey, nice to see you, Jeff. Thanks for having me here today. Absolutely. So before we get into it, because a lot of fun stuff, just give people kind of the, the quick overview of of what you what you guys are all about at Talent Fit AI. Yeah, definitely. So we make it easy to find the right person for the for your context, so your culture of your organization. Basically, we take an evidence based approach uh, to calibrating your culture and then quantifying culture fit. So you actually reduce bias from the hiring process, uh, at least through the phases that we take you through, um, and then ultimately you end up saving time, energy, money, uh, hiring and retaining the right people. So it's both the culture at the company and then it's the culture for the applicant and trying to make a match. Yeah, basically matching their ideal culture, so what they want to get, their sort of fundamental values, their needs, the norms that they have, and then matching that to what the company actually has in internally, uh, not what's necessarily like written on the wall for right. them. Right, <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine the first uh, big point of conversation, went, so you do like a culture assessment uh, at a company, uh, do you come at it from the company point of view or more from the employee uh, applicant point of view? Yeah, so we we actually start by calibrating the culture by understanding like what the culture is across the organization based on employee feedback. Um, from that, we're able to extract that. We do some validation stuff based on performance, uh, based on you know engagement scores, other things like that. Uh, and then from there, anybody who's an applicant who's applying, we can actually help them uh, actually see, or help the company actually assess you know do they actually fit this company culture? Or not. Right. So I would imagine it's kind of like reputation, right? You think your, rep your reputation is not what you say it is, it's what people talk about when you're not in the room. And I would imagine when you're doing kind of a culture assessment, you know, there's one is figuring it out, but I, I, I've got to guess that there's a lot of times where the culture data that you collect based on real data doesn't necessarily match what maybe the leadership team of the company thinks it is. Yeah, and it's actually funny, that's kind of the inspiration for why I even started this company in the first place, is I actually finished my uh, my MBA and joined a, uh, joined a company, and. Um, you know, for me, it was like, you know, we, we went through the hiring process, did all the due diligence, and realized once I joined the team that, you know, my, my, line, my, my ideal culture wasn't exactly what the culture was in the organization. Not saying it was a bad culture, just saying it wasn't the right place for me. Right. And, uh, oh, you know, had the right personality traits and whatnot to do well in the role. At the same time, I wasn't able to actually uh, sort of feel that I got what I needed from the company, and then probably for me too. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things. We help you basically not uh, go into the wrong situation where you're not in a, in a good place to succeed too. Right, and you talk about a bunch of things that kind of determine culture. So there's the, there's the plaque on the wall, you know, as you walk in the front door, but it's really, and you outline it a bunch uh, on your side, it's, it's the norms, it's the behavior, it's how people are rewarded. So there's a bunch of real discrete things that you guys can measure through your process that actually define mm -hmm. culture in a way that you can put numbers on it and you can compare culture A to culture B. Yeah. Yeah, what do you see some of the most important things or where do people usually miss between what they think is the culture and where they execute the culture? Yeah, it's, it kind of varies from company to company. So we use a thing called the cultural signature. This is saying that you know you and I can both sign a check. Right. Hopefully both our checks are going to actually pass and they won't bounce. Um, but your, your signature is no better than mine, mine is no better than yours. It's just unique right, to your own situation. Um, and sometimes you'll see that leadership especially may not be in touch with what the culture of the organization actually is based on their employees' feedback. Um, and so this is what we kind of do. It's kind of like understanding what the culture is, um, seeing those gaps between what leadership thinks and, and what it actually is. And then leadership, if they, you know, if they do care about culture, which most of our customers would, um, they can start making those appropriate changes to get to their aspirational state if they want to. Right, and then when, when we first are getting ready to, to do this interview, and I think to myself, well wait, if, if you're just bringing in people that kind of fit the culture, um, are you just kind of going birds of a feather? Are you missing the, the opportunity of, of what's so important right now in terms of diversity, you know, diversity of opinion, diversity of background, diversity of, of point of view? But you're saying personality um, fit and culture fit are two very different things. And yeah. how do, so how do you look at the difference between personality and getting diversity in the company, which is good, 
versus getting cultural misfit, which is which is not good. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, they're d definitely very different things, and there are some ties to it. But uh, you think of like people often associate with culture fit is, hey, I can sit down and have a beer with you, or you know, uh, we talked to a couple companies like, hey, are you a gamer? Then you're able to be you know be, be able to work with us because you fit our culture. But that's not really what it is, right? At the end of the day, it's about these fundamental values that you have within your organization. Um, you know what you actually want out of the organization, and that it's matching your needs. So, um, and we, we actually have an advisor who's um, you know one of the sort of top diversity inclusion people in, in Canada uh, for a global organization, and uh, she's also helping us through this process of ensuring you know auditing our algorithm, making sure that we're taking the right steps, and, and you know uh, managing and, and ensuring that the uh, you know we're tracking demographic data um, so that we actually do not have bias in our algorithm at the end of the day. So. That's kind of where we're going. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious about kind of where are the bounds of, of the culture in terms of um, kind of number of people, um, if you will. So there's there's obviously, you know, do we fit as, as an employer, an employee, um, you get along with your boss, you have a culture. There's kind of like your, your group yeah. uh, that you're intimately involved with, who you work with day to day, whether that's, I don't know, six people, 10 people. I'm curious if there's kind of a natural bound and then maybe you're part of a department and, and obviously if you work at a company like Amazon, just to pick a name out of that, they have over 600,000 yeah. people. So where, where are the limits of culture or can they successfully span from from all the way at the top, all the way down to those little micro groups? Yeah, so usually think of it as there's core culture to the organization, and that's kind of things that are aligned across the entire organization, right? So you think of person organization fit is how they define it in the research. Um, you get into like things like person group fit, so this could be the specific team you work on. Um, and there's also cultures with these subcultures in the team. So the way we've built our algorithm is actually taking uh, and being inspired by pieces of research that actually look at group fit, look at organization fit, um, and then be able to match people effectively, sort of both of those. So you look at, so you try to look at it all. But at the end of the day, is your, is your um, probability of success within an organization more determined by that kind of close intimate group or the bigger group because then maybe you find a different a different path if that that immediate group doesn't work for you. What do yes. you find? Yeah. So right now, like we're we're still pretty early stage, right? Um, so we're going to be tracking stats and seeing how people actually fit to the overall organization, uh, how they fit to the groups. Right now, we're doing matching to specific groups and teams. Um, you know, because there are subcultures within the organization, those teams will still have those core values of the organization too. But things like their leader may be a bit different, uh, the way they manage their people, right? right. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're looking at right now. And, and do you find that, that senior leadership really understands the importance of culture? Because you mentioned in, in some of your posts on your website and, and, and some of the articles that you referenced that culture can be a great asset, right? Uh, I've interviewed Patty McCord, what the work she did at Netflix is, yeah. is you know, kind of legendary and everybody goes to that deck, it's 127 page slides. Yeah. I don't like slides, I went through the whole, the whole deck, it's yeah. amazing. But it can also be a real negative, it can be a real, a real problem. And, do, do, does, does leadership understand that to the point where they're making the investments to make sure that culture is an asset and not a liability? Yeah, and I think it's changing a lot. I think it used to be leadership kind of set the direction and you kind of had to listen to what was going on and you had to sort of abide by the rules of the culture and if you didn't, you're kind of gone. Um, you know, I think that's shifting a lot because people are more attracted to organizations that they, they know they fit the culture, they feel they align with the culture, they're more uh, likely to accept job offers, they're likely to actually take a pay cut even, a lot of the research is showing. Um, so I think those are, those are factors that are coming to the equation now and, and companies are realizing that um, if we want to attract the top talent, great, everybody can pay X amount of money, right, for a candidate to join. Now at the same time, if you're, if you're being recruited by five different firms and they're all offering the same pay, what's your differentiator? Right, and so culture can be a differentiator, and people, and, and especially leaders, I think, are realizing it could be a competitive advantage. Right, uh, it's going back to, um, uh, you know, this whole the whole top talk of like, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Right, right, um, and I think that's an important thing to think about is that companies I think are buying into that more than ever now. Right, so. but 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 ultimately, it's about execution. Right, it's, mm -hmm. you gotta you gotta execute it. You gotta walk the walk and yeah. and talk the talk. And and clearly, when it works well, it works really well. And yeah. one of the examples we use around here, just because it's so easy and in your face, is the is the war years, right? Perennial losing organization, uh, lose, 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 lose. Uh, they get a change at the top before you know it. You know, they're the, they're the premier kind of brand in the NBA right now. And yeah. that's really been top down, driven by Joe Lacob all the way down to the players. Yeah. Um, but I wonder, is it more of a stick or more of a carrot? Is it, is it because employers now have to do this because of the employment market is so tight? Is it because they're trying to get you know, the younger kids who are coming out of school who are much more mission driven than maybe I was when I got out of school, I just want to get a job and get going? Mm -hmm. or, is, or are they really thinking more holistically, kind of lifetime value of that employment relationship with these people? 
I think it's a bit of both, to be honest. I think they, they obviously see the benefit from the, hey, we can attract the top people here, but they also see the business benefit of it now too, right? Um, and I think that's the one thing that, um, you know, is often forgotten in the past. And I, I love the example of the Warriors, right? And I think this is one thing that, um, you know, kind of like the, the, you know, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts is another, you know, I like using these kind of right, phrases, right? right. Uh, but the, the Warriors is a great example because they have, you know, five A players, you know, on their team, if you want to call them A players. And, um, you know, they're able to work together for the most part. Although earlier this season, you know, they had some issues with their culture. And if you probably look at the winning record there, it was actually pretty, it was pretty low probably during those times when they're having issues internally. Um, so I think it's one of those things. You can also help um, players even level up. So it's like you don't have to recruit that A player every time. You can actually make a B player on the right team that they fit into turn into this kind of A player in that situation, in that context. Yeah. Last question before I let you go, because yeah. I think it's another kind of interesting, interesting thing that's happening is this blurring between, you know, kind of professional life and, and, and your regular life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen it with hours, right? Nobody's working eight to five anymore because you've got meetings with Europe, you got meetings with Asia Pacific, you got meetings with the East Coast from here. So people are on and off their the meetings all the time. You're on and off your phone. You're getting Slack notifications, you yeah. know, all, all through the day. Um, and at the same time, people want, you know, their employees to be engaged and feel part of that. Mm -hmm. um, they want them to, you know, retweet the company line, but they won't necessarily give them the rights to retweet in the name of the company. So how do you see, you know, kind of the motivation of people in this blurring between professional and personal life, mm -hmm. and yet, you know, companies want employees that are bought in, that are, uh, you know, kind of emotionally vested yeah. into this mission-driven culture. Is yeah. see more conflict there? Is it, is it working? Or w what should people be thinking about? Yeah, I think it really comes down to what people want at the end of the day, too, right? If you don't want to be in, you know, tapped in all the time, then then you probably don't want to fit with that. You're probably not going to fit with that kind of organizational culture. And there's lots of other companies out there that maybe not like that, uh, for instance. Um, so I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's one of those things you really just have to understand, like, what, what, is it, what do you value as an individual? Uh, what is a company's value? And then how, how do those things align for you? And, uh, you know, do you want to be on your phone 24-7 or, um, or do you want to and have the flexibility, you know, to be able to, you know, take holidays when you want? Or do you want that nine to five job that's, you know, more structured? And so what we're doing is giving that transparency to both the job seeker and the company now to say like, hey, is it a fit right up front? And if it is, okay, let's start taking you through the hiring process. And then if you don't, that's okay with us because, you know, we're yeah. both not going to benefit from this. This is a two-sided street, right? Right. Um, so it's, it's building that transparency and, and helping people find the place that they'll ideally match with. Right. Well, Mitch, it's a really interesting story, and we didn't really talk about deep into the into AI, but you guys are using you know big science and 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 big data to try to basically increase the probability of success because because a miss is expensive for both sides. Yes, yeah, it's really costly, right? It's uh, you know some of the estimates can be uh, up to three times salary is what it costs when you make a bad hire. Uh, companies, I think it was like 85% of companies say they've made a bad hire in the last year. Um, and from the job seeker side, it's like they're more, you know, they're more likely to accept job offers, um, even at lower pay from companies that they feel they align with the, the values of the organization. And it would be pretty nice now to be able to say like, hey, you actually align and the data shows this too. Right, right. This is all based in, based in top tier research right. too. All right, Mitch, well thanks for, uh, for sharing your story. We'll keep an eye as you, as you yeah. keep growing and, uh, and best of luck to you and the team. Awesome, thanks Jeff, really uh, appreciate having me today. All right, he's yeah. Mitch, I'm Jeff, you're watching theCUBE. We're at our Palo Alto Studios. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.